First of all, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you because I feel really honored to be in your presence amongst so many amazing educators. And I want to ask you a question. How many of you have been in education and this is your first year? Couple, couple, couple. Give them some love. We need you to stick around. How many of you have been in education at least five years? Give them some love. What about, where's our 10 year plus vets? Oh, I have nothing to say now. Give them some love. Any of our 20 year veterans? Oh my goodness, give them some love. Any 30 plus year veterans? Oh! And then everybody else. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, knowing the breadth and the expertise that's in the room, I have nothing to teach you. But I have an hour and 15 minutes to kill. So I'm going to try, to the best of my abilities, to share some stories. They're very personal, so I want to ask you a favor. Some of you have been situated in a way where your back is to, to the PowerPoint because that's the way the tables were set up and I've noticed a lot of you have turned around. If you don't mind, then I can make eye contact. I really requested that they turn up the lights, which is beautiful, so we can see each other a little bit better. Is it okay if we get started? Okay. Before I start, I just want to say thank you to this organization, Responsive Classroom, because although uh, it was an interesting relationship of how we even met each other. Uh, they reached out around Thanksgiving of last year. And I met them in December, and they've opened their doors to me. They took me to visit a responsive classroom in Cambridge, Massachusetts. They took me to visit a responsive classroom school in Western Massachusetts. We've been in constant communication, and I owe a debt of gratitude to Mary Beth Fortin and the entire responsive classroom community. Can you give them some love? And I also owe a lot of gratitude to these students that are to my left and to my right that are up here. Over the last 20 years, these have been the students that have taught a fumbling educator with two left feet who didn't know what the heck he was doing the first, fifth, tenth, fifteenth, and nineteenth year of education, uh, how to meet their needs, how to respond to what's happening. And so a lot of what I'm going to share is the teachings of my students to me. With that in mind, has anybody heard of Dr. Brown, Dr. Brene Brown? If you haven't, the reason they're clapping is because A, she's phenomenal, and you need to look up her TED Talks, but Dr. Brown says that it might be possible that stories are just data with a soul. And so for those of you that like stories, oh, I brought them. And for those of you that like data, I brought that too. And so may we marry data with a soul. Here's what I'm attempting to do. I'm hoping to share a first-person narrative. I'm hoping to talk about how it is that we unpack what people, in this case our kids and our students, carry. How do we engage kids that are carrying trauma and they may or may not be youth on the margins? And finally, how do we do professional development that's meaningful, not one-offs, to support our amazing staff and to have conversations about mindsets. That's a lot to try to accomplish in an hour and 15 minutes. So wish me luck. Thank you. Now I'd like to, I'd like to pray for your attention, not towards me, but towards one of your students. I want you to think about a young man or a young woman, a little boy or a little girl at your school who may have hated school. Or maybe that's a misnomer. Maybe they just didn't connect at school. And think about this young kid who maybe school wasn't for him or her at the time, or the way school was happening, they fell through our cracks. Sadly, over the course of 19 years, a lot of kids have fallen through my cracks and on my watch. And sometimes I look at that and I get really depressed and that's not what I'm asking you to do. But would you take a moment and if you're taking notes, write down the name of that student. Because I want to honor you and honor, not only do you do hard work, but you do heart work. 
trabajo del corazón. And I want to honor that as you take care of your corazón as we continue to do this work. Part of the framework that I'm going to not introduce, because this isn't my work, this is the amazing work of Dr. Chavez, a different Chavez from the Bay Area, who talks about these frames, and she mentions the idea of what is the first backpack that all of us carry. They call that our given reality. And then the second backpack is we learn how to handle things or how to cope. At some point, ideally, our young people and ourselves, we become resilient. And that's our third backpack. And then us as adults, is we begin to find our life's purpose. So part of my goal with my own narrative is to unpack and repack these four backpacks. Now I want to ask you a favor. There are the kids from that side of town, and then there's the kids from that side of town. There's the rich and there's the poor. There's white and there's black and everything in between. And for many, 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 many a years, we've been divided. I want to ask that you consider empathizing for yourselves and empathizing for all. I want to ask that you consider that it's not us and them, but us. I ask, uh, I ask that you consider what would it mean for us to just become an us? And that everyone in your building, from your custodian, and you already know this, from your staff, from your teachers, from everyone involved, to your students and your families, they're all carrying something. And it doesn't have to be traumatic, but we may not know their walk. And so I'm hoping that we use that spirit as we push forward. And with that in mind, I want to make an invitation. I want to ask if you'd be willing to go to elementary school with me. I want to take you back to being five years old. And I want to see if you would unpack with me your first backpack. So if you're ready, if you have something to write with, if, if those of you that are taking notes or you're taking mental or, or notes of the heart, if you'd unpack with me, is that okay? Now I want to show you my first backpack. I was five years old and little Cesar was not this wide and not this old. And, uh, really excited about class. And I have the backpack with me, so I'm going to show it to you, but i got to ask you a favor. Can I unpack it? Um, so, I have it here with me. It was interesting coming, uh, you know, uh, at the airport, because they're like, what's he bringing in the duffel bag? Suspicious. Suspicious. And um, one time long ago, I was five and I was cute. And I was excited about school. And little Cesar had his backpack as he was going to kindergarten. But they called it something different. They called it Jardín de Niños because I wasn't in the U.S. yet. I was in Mexico. I was near two hours south of Guadalajara in the state of Jalisco. And I was so excited about kindergarten. I needed a blue backpack because I heard about a blue backpack called La Mochila Azul on a song. And it had an impact in my life. And I was ready for school. And I didn't have homework yet, so there's no reason for me to carry anything. But I needed to have it anyway, because it was a big deal. And uh, with your permission, I want to unpack this backpack. And when I do, it conjures up a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff. It's going to be hard for you to see some of the language that I was learning, but... And I, I want to apologize for any language that may feel or be derogatory. I don't wish it to be. But the first word that I learned is the word bastard. And I learned that word after my father left when I was two. I don't know why daddy left, but I knew that I felt unwanted. And I'm five and I'm going to school and I want to tell daddy about it, but daddy's gone. The next word that I learned is migration. Because my mom, she was dreaming about this place called El Norte. And I learned to kind of not like El Norte after they, El Norte took her away from me for a little while. My mom said she was going to this place, this land of milk and honey, this place where there was opportunity. And I was like, what is she talking about? We have milk and honey right here. And she was talking about coming to the U.S. and migrating, but I didn't understand what that meant. And she said she'd be gone for a summer. But that summer turned into years. Well, little Cesar, I became multi or bilingual. I became perdido and lost. Ay, de su mice. And um, 
the story isn't just negative. I'm going to put these up on the on uh, up here because I realize that you can only see the outside of my backpack, but it's something else when the kids let you in and let you see what's on the inside. And my mom, part of the good news story is I got reunited with my mom in Los Angeles, California. And I'm not here to tell the story of how we got reunited. That'll be part B for next year's conference in October. <laughs> but um, so we get reunited and I'm so excited. I'm back with my mom. Imagine you've been away from your mom for years and you come back. And my mom started teaching me some valuable lessons. And it wasn't immigration who taught me this, and it wasn't the police or schools who taught me this. My mom said I'm illegal. My mom said I don't belong here. And my mom taught me to bow down and to lower my voice. And she said, Mijo, no tienes ningún derecho. Ten mucho cuidado cuando vayas a la escuela porque te pueden deportar. Cuando llegue la inmigración, quiero que brinques la cerca y ojalá que no te vayan a hacer nada. At age nine, I was being instructed what to do when immigration shows up at the school. I knew what fence to jump, I knew where to go, and I knew that I might be separated from her again, and then she started doing early training in case they shoot her. I'm nine. My pops is gone. My mom is training me for my illegality, and I don't know what the heck is going on. And the final word, is one time mommy didn't come home. And from ages 9 to 17, mommy wouldn't come home on three occasions. And in the early, late 70s, early 80s, I'm dating myself a little bit, we didn't have access to cell phones, at least our family did it. And so there was never a phone call like I've been deported or I'm detained or I'm incarcerated. It's just there's no mommy and there's no daddy. And I can't talk about it at school. Who would I tell? I was told not to talk about it at school. Now, if I would have been with you, I think I could have because I think you would have held me. I think you would have nurtured me. I think you would have found a space to not make me feel illegal because I don't think a child should have to pay for complicated politics. However, I never came out. And so this little boy, this little Cesar, I'd like to say it's, it's just me but it's happening to millions of kids that are showing up to our schools and you don't have to be undocumented to have this story, but many kids are carrying vocabulary and lessons that we may never unpack. It's hard to talk about that one. Now, I sense the room is getting quiet, so it's gonna take a while before we transition, but I think one of the things that Albert Einstein always said is if you only have an hour in PD to solve a problem, spend 55 minutes on the diagnosis. So let's spend 55 minutes on the diagnosis before we get to solutions. Let's unpack the backpack in a way Cesar couldn't. Dr. M M uh, excuse me, Dr. Fully Love, who's an African-American doctor, she talks about the impact of root shock. And Root Shock is a powerful book that I would have your staff read and you should check out if you'd like. And it's what happens when you uproot kids from safe environments and now they're in environments where they're trying to survive. Well, that happen that's happening to a lot of our newcomer kids and that's also happening to a lot of students that are constantly moving. What happens when a kid develops trauma and then post-trauma, and then permanent trauma. And finally, what happens if there's multiple stress levels that are not going away? That's called the stacking effect. And if a kid is not able to find healthy ways to release it, and if we're not having systems of trauma-informed care, kids could develop what's called stuck energy. And this stuck energy is if we don't release stress, it gets stuck in the body. And for me and for many kids like me, it leads to what's called disrupted attachment. If I could highly encourage you to read this book, Destroying Sanctuary, Destroying Sanctuary I would. It's one of the best books I've, I've read in my entire life about how do mental health and social service agencies oftentimes destroy what they've created. Sometimes by their systems and policies that they meant well to implement, but we didn't come to talk about that. A disruption in the ability to trust and feel safe with other people. Disrupted attachment in childhood is a major source of toxic stress. And so oftentimes, 
what we begin to manifest in school at age five, at age six, is toxic stress trying to leave the body, but it looks like disruption. It looks like willful defiance. And we may not know how to support that child. Now, I didn't realize that when I came into the schools in the U.S. that I would also have to carry some new vocabulary. And some of it was, was for good reason that I needed to be labeled, and some of it I'm not so sure. I was labeled an ELL, far below basic, low SES, free and reduced lunch minority, single parent household, remedial, mentally retarded, disabled, and illegal. And I don't know what the impact of that is, but I'll just take the first one. The assumption, I think, for some people, but not you, is that ELLs have special needs. But oftentimes we never hear that ELLs have special talents. That they have the ability to code switch and navigate in complex environments where there's multiple languages coming at them at once, and that creates deep resiliency. But before we start thinking all these poor whatever, no, this happens to teachers too. What happens when we label a teacher the outsider or the rookie teacher as if somehow rookie or veteran means anything? Sometimes what's gotten in the way of me trying something new is my veteranness. Oh, I've been there, I've done that. I don't need to learn anything new. Old dogs don't learn new tricks. I've gotten in my own way of a veteran teacher, and rookie teachers come with fire. So I saw like three of them first-year teachers don't stop their fire. I see you. What about the teacher that leaves at 3 p.m., but we have no idea why. We just assume they don't care. Or a teacher that appears to be voyeuristic, working in the hood to save the hood. Or someone who doesn't live in the neighborhood that they work in, or labeling someone to Teach for America teacher for better or for worse. I think there's a lot of labeling that's happening, and I just want to pose the question, for what? Now, we go from labels to what we're being taught, and again, I want to take you to elementary school because in a lot of preschools, we're still singing that Columbus sailed the ocean blue. In first grade, has been similar to some of my experiences in San Quintin or San Quentin, where kids are instructed to follow a certain line and a certain bell procedure, and it mirrors what happens in some prisons. In many holidays that we celebrate in school, we separate half of you to be pilgrims and half of you to be Indians. And we do really cool art exercises where we have this side create really funny hats with some feathers, and we teach you. And because you're first graders, we talk about this wonderful feast that we had, but we have a hard time ever really engaging in a complicated conversation because it's not age appropriate to talk about rape, genocide, and the theft of land. It's ne that's never a convenient conversation, so we never seem to have it. By fifth grade, we don't talk about Harriet Tubman's well-organized movement as so much as we talk about Lincoln freed the slaves, and we talk about Columbus discovering people that were already here. <laughs> but I, I'm not the radical saying this. This wonderful, bald, white man whom I love very dearly, <laughs> Dr. James Lowen wrote a very powerful book that we don't read in schools called Lies My Teacher Told Me. Now, he never meant to come after teachers, but he understands that social studies and history is a particular tool for a particular reason, but I'm not going to be so didactic to tell you what that reason is. You'd have to decide that for yourselves. And before we get into any politics, let's see how this plays out in an elementary school on the first day of kindergarten. This may be a one-off case, and uh, it may be just a misunderstanding. It's, it's, it's a code violation. Um, I want to bring in a home expert from Texas, because I'm in Texas, and this is the first time I'm in Austin, and we need some Austin, and we need some Texan wisdom to help us understand. And the wisdom of Texas comes in the form of this phenomenal book by Dr. Angela Valenzuela. And Dr. Valenzuela wrote a powerful book called Subtractive schooling and those two those two words should not go together 
but she talks about a concept called subtractive assimilation. That the process of acculturation in which the native culture is rejected and not valued is subtractive. And then there's some kids that just don't like school. And we're not sure why. And there's a myriad of reasons for that. Dr. Valenzuela theorizes the following. I don't know if we should believe it or not, but this is what she theorizes. Youth have a hard time caring for a system that they believe does not care for them. Well, for that little boy, it's kind of hard to come back to school after he had to prove his Native Americanness. Now, that doesn't happen every day in every school. What does happen a lot is kids act out, and we're not sure why they're acting out. Well, let's go to Dr. John Ogbu and see what he has to say. Dr. Ogbu, who's pictured there, he came up with this concept, not willful defiance, but cultural inversion. And what he says is as follows, is that kids oppose the cultural practices associated with the dominant group, including schooling. And what my humble opinion over the last 20 years is, is that I've never in my life met a kid who doesn't want to learn. But I've met many kids who are tired of being scarred by schooling. And you as amazing educators are able to distill the difference. And part of what brings us together here is because we want to create schools of learning and education and not schooling wounds. Now, our default message in the 80s, it was don't do drugs. And our default message when it comes to education is stay in school. That makes sense. Stay in school. Now, how many of you have ever read this phenomenal book by Chip Wood, which is part of the responsive classroom core text called Yardsticks? This is, this is key, and a lot of what I'm going to say is anchored in Yardsticks, and Chip says the following. Children often have to struggle to fit in while retaining some of their cultural identity. And Dr. Valenzuela theorizes the following. That the more time students of color spend in U.S. schools, the more gets subtracted from them. Their history, their role models, their culture, their roots, their pride, and their language. I'm not asking you to believe that. I'm asking you to consider it and to rent the idea. Don't purchase it. Test it out for yourself. Ask your adult staff. Now, how might this play itself out in a middle school? I didn't want to have a Texas example. It just popped up. <laughs> I have a hard time seeing that video because th this eighth grader who says I'm not scared, you're not supposed to be scared, sweetheart. We're not supposed to be creating climates where people are afraid to speak their home language. And so something has happened or something has gotten lost in translation where norms and policies have been created for some and they may or may not impact others. Now, here's something I struggle with. I struggle with anything that you say that opposes my worldview. <laughs> if you have the same challenge that I have, we will have a session, no, I'm kidding. Um, it's hard to receive counter data. There's something called cognitive dissonance. If at any point from this moment forward or when I stepped on, if there was ever any cognitive dissonance, it makes sense. Because cognitive dissonance theory simply says that we want harmony. And when we receive opposing information, and I've received 41 years of a certain kind of instruction, and then some ridiculous Mexican guy shows up and gives me counter data, that may be difficult. And so I'm asking for your permission that we enter into not cognitive dissonance, but that we try to unpack for ourselves, when am I most connecting with the speaker? When am I most disconnecting? And why? And along those lines, I would love to offer this book to all of your schools. There's a powerful book by, I'm trying to read his name, Eduardo Bonilla Silva, and he wrote a book that's titled, Racism Without Racist. Colorblind Racism and the Persistence of Racial Inequality in America. 
That's powerful because why would I ever want to tell you that I have sexist tendencies? Why? Why would I want to do that? And how do I know myself enough to understand when I may not be sexist and I'm privileged from patriarchy and sexism? This is complicated stuff. One of the things that when I go to observe schools, I look for indicators. I try to find out who's gifted and who's labeled gifted and who's labeled remedial. I try to find out who's suspended all the time and who's given multiple chances. I want to find out what the data says about an achievement gap and I like to find out from staff and other adults if there's a belief gap. With that in mind, I want to get out of all of that and now I want to take you to middle school. Puberty. Oh my goodness. Take a moment and take yourself, not to puberty, but to middle school. <laughs> and as you're going, and as you're going to, uh, to, to middle school, I want to ask your forgiveness. If I say anything that has been offensive, let it go. What I've always been instructed is take the good, let go of the bad. And please don't shoot the messenger. But if there's anything in the message that works for you and your kids and your school, take that with you. I hope that makes sense. Well, middle school is a special time, and, and part of the backpack that I chose is this backpack that's on fire. Anybody here Alicia Keys fans? So Alicia Keys has this song called This Girl's on Fire. Well, in middle school and now, I wasn't a girl and I'm not a woman, so I'm not, I'm not Alicia Keys and I'm not much of a singer. But I was on fire because adults were always telling me what to do in middle school. My parents, my neighborhood, my teachers, everyone. And I wanted to respond, but I didn't have healthy outlets to do so. So I was doing the opposite of explosions. I was imploding. And you might have a lot of kids in your campuses that want to implode, especially by the language and power of our words. And that's one of the pillars of what Responsive Classroom talks about, that there's a real power to our words. And we create certain dynamics where I'm the teacher, I'm in charge, it's my way or the highway, I said so, and what does a kid do with that? That's hard. This is something that's really difficult for me to share and almost embarrassing, and I ask for your forgiveness ahead of time. In art class, I fell in love with art. I didn't fall in love with art because I was a very good artist. I fell in love with art because I found Elmer's Glue. <laughs> Elmer's Glue had a huge impact in my life because I no longer had to deal with my complex trauma. I was no longer illegal, I was no longer a wetback, I was no longer invisible in history, I was no longer impoverished, I was no longer anything. And this is how I went to sleep at night during most of my middle school. I'm tired. I'm tired of being a wetback. I'm tired of being less than. I'm tired of being abused. I'm tired of all this pain. I just want to die. Ah. So many kids just want to die. So many kids just want to die. And they're on our watch. What do we do? And I understand why we have zero tolerance for drugs. Why we can't allow drinking and smoking and popping pills and doing that. I understand. And I know this audience is complex enough to not kick a kid out but to ask why. Why are you drinking? Why are you popping pills? Why are you taking so much Dayquil? Why do you not want to wake up? I want to introduce you to the Boys and Girls Club of my neighborhood. They're gangs. And we don't hear them described that way very often. But that's why we're at this conference. Try something new. And so I didn't know these colors came from the U.S. flag, and I didn't know there was a, a point of divide and conquer until I read the Willie Lynch letter. Willie Lynch was a slave owner who wrote a letter about divide and conquer. And these colors are colors that bleed from the flag. And so if you can divide people into bloods and crips, norteños and sureños, and they're competing for very few amount of resources, what happens is violence and trauma 
but I just want you to rent this idea. Those of us that got to go to college and were introduced to sororities and fraternities, they may have been for us, but what if these are sororities and fraternities of the hood? What if this is the boys and girls, uh, boys and girls clubs for kids that don't feel like they have boys and girls clubs that reach out to them? Now, you might only think, well, isn't it violent? I don't think that it has to be. I think that some kids are looking for family. And we say no to this, but we close our school door at 6 o'clock. Who protects them at 6.01? And it's not your responsibility per se or mine, but it's a reality that this becomes a second family for some people. This becomes a rites of passage, a sense of belonging, a sense of camaraderie, a sisterhood and a brotherhood for those that are really on the margins. And I'm wondering if we're called to stand on the margins with the demonizing, so as my mentor, Father Greg Boyle, would say, the demonizing will stop. No sé. No sé. But middle school was definitely hard. So can we leave middle school? I've, I've depressed the daylights out of the higher regency. We need to turn a corner. I got good news. It, do, it, di, it did not stay there for me but it did stay there for the many kids that I've buried over the last 20 years. But I want to turn the corner. And I want to show you what you look like when you're awesome. This is a freedom educator like many of you who believes that education is a calling. His name is Tony Diaz. And I know that when we see people who look like me on the news, we may see them as a six o'clock criminal, but this guy is trafficking. He's trafficking books. He's a book trafficker. And he's on this underground railroad right now, trafficking books into Arizona and into Texas. And we just visited one of, his, one of the stores here in Texas. Jazzy, what's it called? There's a bookstore in Austin that you got to see called Libros Resistencia inside of a house. Where there's an underground movement to teach Latino studies. Because it matters. But it says down here that it's been banned, and that's the fancy word for de jure. I thought it was a type of mustard, but it's not. De jure. I don't even know if I'm saying it right, but I want to sound fancy. De jure. Pass the de jure. Well, Arizona and Texas has officially banned women's studies, African American studies, Chicano Latino studies, Native American studies, Asian American studies, under the umbrella of ethnic studies. It's illegal to teach it. But do not hate on my Arizona or my Texas, because the other 48 states are doing it de facto. It's never a graduation requirement in any state for any student to know his or her history, not this his or her history. This leads me to resiliency. The third backpack, resiliency, I came alive and I saw people come alive when we were mirrored a process of mirroring when you could see yourself in the history books. And the first time that happened, I had a freedom teacher like you who said, do you know who Lucy Gonzalez is? And I was like, who? That's my tia, right? But no, it wasn't my tia, it wasn't my auntie. This is, this is one of our sheroes. This is one of our labor leaders. This is why we have banned child labor. Lucy Gonzalez Parsons, part Native American, part African American, part Mexican American, grew up in Chicago. They were so scared of her, the Chicago Police Department said, she's more dangerous than a thousand rioters. And she would row a Navy pier on a boat and she would organize people to demand a 40 hour work week and she was victorious and I was so excited to learn about her but she doesn't show up in the history books. Oh man, remember, remember my training from my mom telling me I was illegal? She was technically wrong. When they gave me this map, I saw Mexico next to California. And then I started asking questions and let me, let me try, let me try, let me try my enunciation. California, Texas, Nevada, Oregon, Arizona, están en español. Because two grandmothers ago, you're standing on Mexico. And two grandmothers later, we're wetbacks. We owned land here. We never crossed a border, but a border crossed us. 
And what's illegal is the U.S. Government Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Article 10, that says all Mexican land is to be respected. Welcome to Mexico. Welcome to Texas. Welcome to the Southwest. It should all be honored, but certain histories don't matter. But when I learned mine, shoo, I found my voice. And imagine when your so-called Hispanic kids, I prefer to call them Latinos, when they find their voice, they're not going to take over anything. They're not going to hurt you. They're not going to be violent. They're going to be proud. And imagine what pride does. And when you see pride, then you hear about 10,000 Latinos who fought in the Civil War. And then you hear about your people it's desegregating U.S. public schools. And you can watch a documentary about it. It's online, thanks to the late, great Howard Zinn. And it's called the Lemon Grove incident and hear about elementary school kids desegregating schools so that all of us could be in school together and that no longer creates a them or an us and a we but only an us and then you hear that we are all Americans because you see the sombrero and you see Uncle Sam's hat and you see a real poster from World War II saying we are all Americans and then you hear about Rosie the Riveter who knows who she is and who knows who Rosita la Remachadora is? That's the real Rosie the Riveter. It's Mexican-American women who went to work in the railroads in the United States who helped build this country. They're not just anchor baby makers. They're also builders of this country. And what happens to the 500,000 Latinos who fought with the greatest generation on earth, but they didn't show up in Tom Brokaw's book? And this man was the first dreamer, undocumented, Macario Garcia, who received the highest Congressional Medal of Honor from Harry Truman. Latinos received the most Congressional Medals of Honor in World War II. But it's just not in the social studies book when we get back to our sites on Wednesday. So what are we going to do with the books? I got an idea. Recycle. When you can teach about 5,000 Mexican kids desegregating schools in Orange County, California, the precursor case of Brown versus Board of Education, Mendez versus Westminster, and you can do it at the first grade level with this beautiful book, Separate is Never Equal, by Duncan Tonatiu. You can begin to do something powerful. You can begin to instill pride in young people. So what started to happen to me is I began to find my voice and I started to do something called writing, which is what you want to assess in your standardized test. But now writing had meaning because I wanted to write the following. I wanted to express both the pain and the joys of our community. So I'm going to share with you a 30-second poem. Ah, it's called I Wonder. You wonder why I drink? do drugs, steal, rob, kill? You wonder why I never cared about your opportunities? You wonder why I never enlisted in the service? You wonder why I dropped out of preschool, elementary, middle school, high school, college, and now a PhD program? You wonder why we're always poor? You wonder why we're always pregnant? You wonder why we're always in jail? Well, I wonder why there's a liquor store on every block with a government license in my neighborhood. I wonder why the FBI and the CIA under the Pro papers would want us addicted to crack. I wonder why if I steal a slice of pizza to eat and it's strike three in California, I get life in prison. But if I were Enron and I stole $1.9 billion, I'd get a pardon. I wonder why they're still teaching me that Lincoln freed the slaves and Columbus discovered us. I wonder why News at 11 had my mother as a top story as a welfare queen when we all know that the largest recipients of welfare are multinational corporations. America, I wonder how it is that you even blame me for the problems that you helped to create. I wonder, don't you? Gracias. The reason, the reason I say gracias is because I'm hoping you clap because they didn't clap in my high school. They escorted me out with my willful, defiant self. <laughs> but when you start doing third grade poetry slams and kids get to share their stories, something starts to light up when a kid gets to be right here. Because this is five-year-old Cesar getting another chance, and you're giving it to me. That's big. When we teach young people at the elementary school level resiliency strategies like Don Ruiz, Don Ruiz is one of the amazing mentors to Oprah, and he wrote the book The Four Agreements. But he wrote a very accessible book to elementary kids called The Voice of Knowledge. 
It's fabulous. And then we can go into ancient Chinese cultures, the I Ching, and teach the I Ching. And kids begin, they're already into Ninja Turtles. They're already into Ninjago and Senseis. So they're understanding that there's a code of how to behave yourself. So teach them what the ninjas know. Teach them the I Ching. Now, I want to ask you what you see. And I have some gifts for the brave ones. I brought some books that I want to give away. Somebody raise your hand and tell me what you see. In the back, what do you see? Two fences. Thank you. Can you come up? Can I give you a book? Can you give her some love? Take your pick. Okay, thank you. What else do you see? Yes. You raise your hand super quick, like, I want a free book and stuff. No, I'm just kidding. What would you see? Yeah. Yeah, you got it. Take your pick. I got one more. What do you see? Right there, gentlemen, right there. What do you see? Huh? Oh, my goodness. I knew these are freedom educators. Thank you, thank you. This is for you. It's all I've got left. So thank you. And so um, my mom... She wasn't just a teacher of teaching me to be illegal. I told you she got deported three different times. And my mom told me a really interesting story. And she said, mijo, do you only see the 20-foot fence? Or do you see the 21-foot ladder? And you might be on different sides of the immigration debate, so ignore immigration for a second. At our schools, we have 20-foot problems but you've been strapped with a 21-foot ladder. And when young people realize their resiliency skills, that they can overcome just about anything, heck, sky's the limit. We might actually dream to change the world. And the reason I've come to be in your presence is for the rest of the time, I only want to speak about 21-foot ladders. So check this out. In order for me to get to my life's purpose and for young people to get to their life's purpose, I believe kids got kids to find their hidden gifts. And I remember I told you about my dad, but I described him in negative ways. And there's always at least two ways to look at a situation. So yes, my dad made me a bastard, but my dad also stopped abusing my mom and I. And I didn't understand what he was going through, but the only thing he could do was leave because he was going to literally kill us. And so when I turned 21 and my father committed suicide and my mom explained what happened, I was finally able to go through the process of forgiveness. And that's one of the most powerful F words in school. It's forgiveness. And so, Dad, wherever you're at, I forgive you. Thank you for leaving us because you stopped abusing us. When I told you that my mom left and migrated to the United States, I didn't want to stay without her, but I got deeply rooted as a tree, and I didn't know that I would need my deep roots when I was my most in pain. And so I want to thank mom because in Mexico I learned about another language because my natural language is not Spanish. I'm not from Spain. My language is Nahuatl. It's Sotzil. It's Quechua. When people are bilingual and they speak Spanish from Spain and English from England, they speak two wonderful European languages. But I would have never known that. And so I'm thankful for being deeply rooted. When I mentioned that my mom got deported, I don't want to give a shout out to immigration for that. But um, you grow up kind of fast when you're nine and you got to cook and you got to get to school and you got to get to bed on time and you got to have your priorities. You're nine. And so, man, this resiliency stuff helps because life knocks us down, but it hasn't knocked us out. And I was, I was bilingual, I was perdido and lost, but it's beautiful when you find yourself and when you create the conditions in your classroom for kids to find themselves literally and figuratively. Oh, wow. And finally, I used to be illegal. Now I'm just a non-carrying card member of the United States who's undocumented, who's been paying taxes since he's 17 in his ancestral homeland. Hope, I hope that, that we can ally ourselves that way, but I know it sure is difficult, and our news agencies broadcast it differently. And so that led to finding my life's purpose. I like all of you. Now, how, let me ask you. How many of you absolutely know that your life's purpose is to be an educator, a cheerleader, an empower machine, someone that's going to change the world through education? Who just knows it already? Whoo, that's beautiful. 
That's beautiful. It's okay if that's not you or it's okay if that's not your life's purpose. For me, it started with realizing, and I didn't come to speak about God, but I'm going to speak about God for this much, is that I'm a child of God. And that's part of my life's purpose is to make that manifest. The second thing is I'm tired of broken homes. And you know what Responsive Classroom did? Is I'm in Boston, Massachusetts trying to pull off a PhD right now. My wife is in Los Angeles. They flew us both to be here. Can you give my wife some love? She's right here, Hasmi. Now, we left the babies alone because they got to they gotta go through struggle. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Exit wounds. I'm like, we're, get, we're, we're deporting the kids. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but we have three amazing, healthy kids, and, and, it's, and it's awesome. And it's awesome that there's a movement in America to expand the definition of family because family should only include love, right? And so I knew that in part of my life's purpose, I want to be an educator, but this seems hard. How do I take on two-plus centuries of subtractive schooling? Of We're living in the 21st century with an 18th century or 19th century model. How do we value new histories when we've never been taught that? How do we unpack backpacks and how do we make cultural inversion or willful defiance not the norm? Well, I went to my cousin. No, he's not my cousin, but that's Dr. <laughs> Robert, Robert Rosenthal. And Robert Rosenthal is a genius. And in the 60s, he did this amazing study where he went into an elementary school. Now, you can't pull off these kind of studies anymore because he just went crazy and lied. But he went in and he told these teachers that the kids were going to take an IQ test. Who's heard of the Rosenthal study? You already know what I'm talking about. And so he said, after the results came back, that the kids that had a star, an asterisk next to their name, are amazing. They're just bloomers. And then he left. And a year later, I need to read you the findings. For the entire school, the children for whom the teachers had expected greater intellectual growth averaged significantly greater improvement than in the controlled children. When teachers expected that certain children would show greater intellectual development, those children did show greater intellectual development. And that's important because that's the Pygmalion effect. If I believe that poor little Cesar is undocumented and, and an ELL learner and he's not, I shouldn't really challenge him and pobrecito, the worst thing I can do to Cesar is sympathize. But the best that I can do is empathize. And to understand that he, like every other student, deserves to be challenged. And here's my question. Wouldn't you want to be in a school where every teacher, every family, every kid had an asterisk next to their name? I want to be at that school. I want to go back and rename my school. We're the asterisk school. What? What is it? And if you want to get there, here's a little offering for PD. Read Pygmalion in the classroom and how it manifests in subconscious ways where we have to focus on some and not the others. So what happens? With that in mind, I want to go to a very serious matter, and I don't wish to push your buttons at all, this video has bad language, and I apologize for that. It also has graphic images, and I say as, a, as an educator a community that we take care of each other, that if you need to step out because the video is too heavy, I understand. But I would, I would do a disservice if I didn't show you this video, and it follows what this amazing work by Chip Wood said. Chip Wood says the following. Lower achievement among African-American children is often a function of the way they are perceived and treated by their teachers rather than a function of their home or community culture. And yet, there's no way that we can connect that or equate that to, to schools per se, but everyone has teachers. Cops have teachers, and there's good cops, and there's cops that aren't. And there's kids in the community that end up doing a lot of harm, and many of them are still kids. And what I ask myself is, how would I respond if my child was murdered or my family member was murdered? And what we have on our hands, on our collective watch, is a major tragedy. 
If I describe to you church bombings and church killings and mass killings and school killings and college killings, some lives don't matter. They really don't. And we need to make them matter. And we have a lot of agency as educators. We have a lot of power as educators. And I came with the powerful. And I didn't come to bring bad news or sad news, but I just came to bring a truth. And there's multiple truths. And I hope you'll hold on to that truth as well. Now, I told you that we were going to pivot to life's purpose. So every time I approach a school, I would never describe it as this is the number of free and reduced lunch. But I didn't have the opposite language. Where do you work? Well, you know, I work with this many kids in poverty and this. And it's how we begin to talk about that almost frames the conversation. But what if we've never been taught any other way? So here's another way. This is Dr. Tara Yoso, and she has something called Community Cultural Wealth Model. And she talks about that there's an array of knowledge, skills, abilities, and contacts possessed and utilized by communities of color to survive and resist macro and micro forms of oppression. And what she means by Community Cultural Wealth is that Imagine when kids are being shot at, when they're hungry, where there's very few resources, where there's a lot of liquor stores, where the community is flooded with cocaine and guns, but no history books to save their life, and yet they still have aspirational capital. That means they still have hope. Now that's wealth. When you can still carry hope in the, in the midst of trauma, we need to capitalize on that. Familia capital. When we have resources like aunties and grandmas and cousins and uncles and entire kinship communities working together, that's a capital that can't be measured. You could be the richest person in the world and not have that kind of capital. My grandfather used to say the following, some people are so poor, all they have is paper money. So it's what we value. And there's nothing wrong with paper money, but there's a lot of capital in the hood. And this is what education could look like. And I want to thank the state of Arizona for doing something really powerful. Take a look at this. We're not, we're not just living in the times of the Black Lives Matter movement. We're also living in the times when in 1953 there was a lot of struggle to get Brown versus Board of Education in the books. It was difficult times. Well, the state of Arizona banned the, this kind of teaching, ethnic studies, and then the kids, the parents, and the teachers sued the state of Arizona, and it went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and they just won. So during our tenure in 2015, this case is going to the U.S. Supreme Court, and we're living in very intense times. But when you hear all that, in the 10 minutes that I have left, where do we even begin? I say you start with the babies. These are black and brown babies from the neighborhood who happen to be in our garage. My wife and I were running a center in our home, and we began to ask kids, when is school fun? When are you most alive? When are you most into it? And they begin to tell you stuff. And then you ask young people, where do you do your homework? And oftentimes kids tell you, we don't have a lot of spaces. So we began to ask parents to lend their backyard, and education began at 6.01 p.m. when all the after-school programs closed. And that little homie, he didn't want to hang out with the little girls, so he hangs out with the older boys, but it's creating a culture of educational empowerment. And we couldn't get the Latino parents to come to school. Guess why? Because they had two or three jobs. But when we did the meetings at 10 o'clock at night, there's a fire pit, it's so cold, but they're there, they're packed in the backyard, they're interested, they're, they're, they're excited, but oftentimes our parent club and our, our coffee with the principal is at the time that is most convenient for us or most inconvenient for certain parents, so what about multiple sessions for multiple needs? All of that led to, I wrote this book out of necessity. And I'm excited, not because I'm selling it to you, because I'm not, but it just got picked up by Barnes & Noble, and it's a book about Latino history for gang-involved youth. But books, books in my neighborhood of East Oakland don't stop bullets, and we needed to do something different, because the level of complex trauma in my neighborhood is intense. We started working with having young people meet living heroes and sheroes. Here they are in the living room of Helen Chavez, 
who is the co-founder of the United Farm Workers, along with Cesar Chavez. Because when kids meet sheroes and heroes who look like them, they begin to realize, I too can make a difference. And young people need to understand that there is no justice without struggle. They need to understand what's the difference between education and schooling and understand why education is so important. And it's not just for a job, but that's one answer. Young people need to be able to find their voice. They also need to find spaces at school where they can release in an emotional way and develop the resiliency skills that they need, and this can happen with first graders. Young people need to also help others in need because second graders can help first graders. First grade can help kindergarten. Kindergarten can help preschool. And the question is, who do we see? Do we see Malcolm Little, who is selling drugs, who just got arrested, whose mom is in a mental institution because they, the Ku Klux Klan killed her husband? Do we see Malcolm Little, or do we see one of the greatest civil rights heroes of our time? Do we see Malcolm X? Who's in front of you? They all got asterisks. As we began to develop the pilot for we're trying to open up an innovative school in East Oakland, these are the initial drawings. And when CBS News showed up, I want to show you what they captured, what they saw. The, the, where I want to end, our theory of action is simple. If homies youth or if kids are socially, emotionally nurtured, if they're meeting their material needs like Maslow would say, if they're paired with caring adults like yourselves, if they're presented with culturally relevant education, then they will learn, they will thrive, and they will self-actualize. And right now, our dreams are kind of all over the place. This is the design for the Phoenix building. And my students put a challenge forth and they said, Cesar, you talk all about education and how important it is. Why don't you apply to Harvard? And I thought, well, no, that's where Kennedy went and that's where Obama went. It's not where this beaner is going to go. I've got no papers, I've been paying taxes, but it's taxation without representation. They're not gonna take me. Well, in seven months, I'll be the first Mexican immigrant and male with a doctorate in educational leadership from Harvard, God willing. And I only say that to say the following, don't give up on your Malcolm Littles, and uh, don't give up on yourselves. Take care of yourselves as a staff, as in a community. Put the pieces together. And as you do, you begin to see the phoenix take shape. And all I was trying to do was to tell you that we've all been given a given reality. We've all figured out a way to cope. We've figured out a way, hopefully, to be resilient. And what's our life's purpose? I left my contact information there because if this would be meaningful at your school, at your district, in your community, it'd be an honor to be in your presence. And we may have room for a couple of questions, but before we go there, I just want to say, indeed, it has been an honor to be in your presence. Thank you so much, and I love you. Thank you.